decent preview and that if you don't walk away thinking, I think maybe it's about something and I hope it's going to be good, um, that you walk away with the information that you need to make good decisions. Um, in this preview, we hope to accurately provide a very clear snapshot of what a high school career looks like at Great Hearts Western Hills Upper School. To that end, you will hear about our academic, extracurricular, and athletic culture from some of our school leaders who will be fixtures during your time, your students' time here at Great Hearts Western Hills. You'll hear from some recent Great, Great Hearts graduates as well, and you will hear from Mrs. Fitzgerald and Mrs. Woods who oversee uh, Ms. Fitzgerald oversees college counseling for Great Hearts, and Mrs. Woods is actually the college counselor over at Great Hearts in Northern Oaks. My part is to describe to you at the beginning the goal that each of these parts of our high school culture serve. This school exists to cultivate virtue, and that specifically means human excellence. That is my sincere desire for each and every one of the students. Here's a short story I'd like to use. To help you remember, when we speak about the cultivation of virtue at Great Hearts Western Hills, what does that actually mean? And virtue is what happens after you cultivate the habit of making good decisions over and over again. I'm going to tell you the story of Chelsea Sullenberger. He was the pilot, if you remember, of the U.S. Airways in January of 2009. On the morning of January 15th, he prepared to pilot Flight 15. 49 out of LaGuardia Airport. He and his co-pilot performed their routine and quadruple checked everything to make sure that it was functioning. They cleared for takeoff and indeed began their flight toward Charlotte, North Carolina. But two minutes into the flight, a flock of Canadian geese flew into both of the engines of flight 1549. Within seconds, the engines both powered down and would not come back online. At this point, the plane was just over the Bronx, which was at that time the most densely populated part of the New York City area. All at once, Captain Sullenberger was faced with one decision which contained hundreds of small decisions. That primary decision was where to land the plane. He could land at a distant rural airport, but who knows if he had enough uh, engine power left to get there, and he might actually crash land, or crash land, not only killing the people on the plane, but crash land in an area taking a lot more people on the ground with them. He could head for the Turnpike Bridge and hope to somehow get it so that it would land on that narrow strip of concrete over water. Obviously, you can understand how that would be precarious. And the next one was the risk and benefits of possibly landing in the Hudson River. Having decided to land on the Hudson River, Captain Sullenberger and his co-pilot had a series of crucial tasks to perform in just a few minutes. They had to shut down the engines, they had to set the right speeds of the plane that would glide as long as possible without power, and they had to get the nose of the plane down to maintain speed. They had to disconnect the autopilot so that they could take control of the plane. They had to activate the ditch system, which is the system by which you make the airplane waterproof and capable of uh, floating on water and not taking in water. Most important of all, they had to fly and then guide the plane in a fast left-hand turn so that it would come down facing south, going with the flow of the river. And having already turned off the engines, they had to do this using only the battery-operated battery systems and the emergency generator. They had to straighten the plane up from the tilt of the sharp left turn so that on landing, the plane would be exactly level from side to side. And then they had to get the nose up again, but not too far up, and land straight and flat on the water, kind of like hit it by pancake. Everyone on the flight was safely evacuated, with Captain Sullenberger himself checking the plane four times before evacuating. There are great pictures of everybody standing out on one of the wings, and the worst case scenario, people had wet clothes and soggy shoes, but they all survived the landing. I want you to remember this story as a picture of virtue, of human excellence. Captain Sullenberger logged thousands and thousands of hours in flight training and developing many sound habits in flight school. Before that, he was president of his Latin club, first chair of flautist, and a student earned both a bachelor and two master's degrees. He worked hard to attain sound habits and cultivated an excellence of mind and a courageous heart. 
not to mention being fit enough to wrestle a plane which it had lost its power steering when it was 58 years old. If you've ever lost power steering in your car and had to be pushed, you find it really difficult to do the, the wheel, but that's only your car. Imagine it is a plane. I'm not saying that every graduate will be a life-saving pilot celebrity. Rather, our hope is that upon graduation, you are well on your way to the cultivation of virtue in your heart and mind, so that when you have to make a difficult choice, your heart and mind are so accustomed to finding the decision which is most advantageous, most just, and most noble, that you won't have to think twice. And that you may do so thinking clearly, free from bias, and free to find the decision that is best. The act of learning how to learn or becoming free is not easy, and that's something that the teachers and I want to gift you with, that ability to learn for yourself. The material we will study will be tremendously amazing but difficult. The way we study is demanding. You will stumble along the way. Yes, you will stumble along the way, but that's a good thing because we all know that we learn the most by the mistakes that we make. You will give your best effort, and it may not result in exactly the A that you hoped for. You will come to your teachers feeling spent and tired. I hope you do come to your teacher during these moments. You will come, uh, your teachers will look at you with commensurate passion, and perhaps be also somewhat sad when they see you suffering and frustrated, but they will know your growth, and what we need to do going forward is solidify knowledge and grow in the act of attaining true knowledge. It may be far easier to take some sort of program that is self-paced and I can get through it really quickly so that I can get the credit so that I can move on. But if students' feet never touch the ground and actually touch the things that they are studying, if they never learn through independent exercise to walk by themselves with their heads erect and unafraid, of an intellectual opposition and difficulty, then we haven't done our jobs. So my vision for Great Hearts Western Hills Upper School is to give you the means to train your mind such that you have the means to learn regardless of where you are. That is the aim which calls for a rigorous course of study. You will also be surrounded by a very intentional community. Your teachers and administrators will be here every year. We will, much like your parents, watching their children for the first time going up a Texas hill and desire your ability to scale it and conquer it, we will be like that. But that will be an activity we assume for you. We will watch excitedly, breathlessly, as you begin and struggle and mature toward confidence in your ability to read, write, speak, listen, observe, and think. And your friends will be here too. And you'll be forming friendships around common good ideas. You'll be forming friendships around significant and common work shared pursuits of interest in clubs and sports and shared experiences in our calendar of rituals, specifically in our house system. In fact, Great Hearts has been thinking about these factors for a long time. Here are two excerpts from our philosophical care for pillars. Character arises from forming habits of the heart, training the affections, and is ultimately defined by what one loves. These habits of the heart concern both the teacher and the student. The main schooling transaction between student and teacher is one of mutual affection and greatness, the best that has been thought, said, created, and done. Here at Great Hearts Western Hills, we will offer a life-changing, one-track curriculum, a vibrant, animated faculty, a culture built with your soul and mind. In short, we are offering fertile ground for friendships that will enhance your learning but will also be unshakable. I still have a few friendships and relationships with some of the students I've taught over the years. And I actually just last spring received um, from a student I taught in fifth grade um, her senior thesis, which she had written inspired by some of the things that we had done together in class and something that I had worked with her on specifically, and that was perseverance. Um, so those, those friendships and relationships that we build as faculty, we hope always will come home in the hearts and lives of our students as they become their own man and woman. But I've spoken enough. Uh, I would like you, you to hear from some of our faculty and some student perspectives. I want to welcome up Great Hearts alumni to share with you their perspective now that their adventure at Great Hearts Northern Oaks is over and they've started a new one. 
Please welcome Susie Tarasas and Davis Pepper. Thank you. 
should be rewarding because being the guinea pigs also endears you very much to your teachers. Your teachers uh, are very thankful for you, you know, stepping up and taking one for the team, basically. Uh, I think it's also kind of fun. <laughs> was there anything that was hard to get used to or you didn't like in the beginning, but now you look back on it and are so grateful for it? I think one of the biggest things that everyone that comes to mind is Pop culture, <laughs> the pop culture, you're not allowed to talk about pop culture. Um, for me as a person, I really didn't understand why we couldn't talk about pop culture in the classrooms, and it was really hard to get used to not bringing up like a, some, like a TV show that I saw the other day, but I think as we grew, it really came to me that it, pop culture was mostly a distraction um, from the, the things that we were doing in the classroom. And so now I understand, you know, obviously older and more mature, that these things, uh, that not talking about pop culture was really a benefit to us. Yeah, I, I, I remember there was a couple classes where I feel like teachers kind of experimented and let us every once in a while bring it up. Um, and I think that we found, it only happened in the senior year, but I think that we found that we stopped because whenever we did bring up pop culture, there was a lot of people and the big part about discussion is getting across your ideas, and although a pop culture reference may help, um, sometimes other people don't have, haven't seen it, and so they don't get the reference. Um, I think another hard thing um, for all of us was uh, the uniform. Um, I feel like you're asking yourself why am I wearing a uniform, and I understand that the polos and stuff, they're not the most comfortable. Uh, we referred to them as like the cardboard shirts. <laughs> But um, it brings a sense of unity to the students. Um, we're all on the same level here. We're all on the same learning level. There's no, nobody is wearing a shirt that says, oh, you know, he's got that green green shirt. He's got that green shirt. Or he's uh, wearing this pop culture reference or whatever. Um, it would really help the students just to look at every single person as people and to say, you know, it helps you discuss. It helps you get along with your own peers. Last question, describe how your teachers play a part in your life. Um, teachers are the absolute, like, you need the teachers. The teachers are what made Great Hearts Northern Oaks so great. Is every single teacher at Great Hearts Northern Oaks cared so much for every single student. They, you know, so flexible on two great times. Uh, in classes, they would have slowed down if you needed them to. And there was an obvious care in the students. There was no favoritism, there was nothing that, that, that obviously showed that a teacher cared about one student more than another. Um, and even um, something that I was irritated about in eighth grade was that a lot of times, you know, students in this meeting would go to the headmaster and they would come back with, you know, stories about me and the headmaster just kind of sat and talked and talked about random stuff. Um, and as I grew up, I realized that it wasn't the lack of punishment that I wanted, I wanted them to be punished, but it was that lack of punishment and that love that the, the teacher or the, uh, the head of the school showed to that student that helped them readjust and to better themselves because they knew that they were loved. I think at Great Hearts, there's, in the teachers, there's such a familial love between the students and just the staff and everyone cares so much about each other. And you could just feel and you could see how much the teachers really cared about the students. Um, they would always ask me, like, oh, how are your students going? How are you doing in classes? How are you? You know, is your mental health okay? And I think that it's just one of the important things, especially, you know, the learning. If you can't get through the day, you know, at least you have someone there to be there for you. And those are the teachers at Great Hearts. Have you kept up with, with any of your teachers? Yeah, there's several there's of my teachers that I've kept up with. And whenever you come back to school, it's always a warm welcome. There's always very um, yeah, I think that the biggest thing I would say is that as we grew through the years, our teachers grew with us, um, and that as the teachers get to know you better, um, you know, your relationship grows, grows more and more with them, and at any grade, and, you know, in those younger grades, you might feel like the teacher's picking on us, the teacher's being really harsh on us, but most of the time it's because the teachers know you yet, 
and as they get to know you, they understand, they can help you better, and they know what you have to give. What one thing would you tell all the seventh day players in this room right now as a piece of inspiration? Students focus on the American tradition. 
And if you go back to this core description on the second page, if you look at the ninth grade, what they read, um, they read a short history of the United States, uh, Mark Twain, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Confederate Papers, Democracy in America, My Aunt Mia, which is my favorite book, and Old Man and the Sea, The Great Gatsby, and also Shakespeare's Othello. And you might say, well, why? Why are we throwing Shakespeare into this mix? We're not throwing Shakespeare into the mix because we're expanding the thinking mind of our students. I don't know about you, but at this age, I still have a really hard time reading Shakespeare. But every time I read it, I feel as if my soul is being enriched. And I want to speak it at proper older English to my students, be now and be witty with the phrases. I'm not good at it. Um, but I have the understanding. So it goes in a way backwards. So ninth grade is a very tradition, and tenth grade is modern history. What is interesting is this, while well, ninth grade students really truly really learn about uh, the history of American politics, right? In tenth grade, they happen to read law, the second choice of government, and they read how law can imagined European politics to be like, especially the vision of the government in three branches. And so we have a lot of students that go, wait a minute, did Locke steal this from us? No, no, he didn't steal it. He threw it, it's a philosophical idea, which our American founding fathers put into practice, which it exists and flourished as a society to this day. The second one is that men letters really do not aim at comprehensive mastery by the students of the content and form of the great books. It is a seminar that aims at giving the students a good first rate of the books in the course. They read Gravis Karamazov in 12th grade. I have stuck. I have read the first 250 pages of this beautiful book, and I have stuck, and I'll finish it someday. Just because they read it in 12th grade, it doesn't mean that I'm reading really anything in their college experience. Some of my former students have attended Dallas University, uh, which is a lovely, lovely school. They also focus on the great books, and they also have really read the books I read 9th to 12th grade. And they've never said former students of ours, oh yeah, we read again for our struggles. So they said, oh my goodness, I read it again, and now I'm understanding it from this point of view. Because our minds grow, our understanding, our experiences change us. I am not the person I was when Mr. Ellison hired me in 2006, and I thank goodness for that, because who wanted to speak to that person now? Um, <laughs> and the third thing that I want us to keep in mind is that we make letters, even though it is not for this discussion, we truly do not do it in the style of Socrates. So if you read of Socrates in your life, he happens to be ironic, witty, and he tries to truly fumble you in your thinking and never give you the answer, right? Um, our teachers don't do that. Our job is not to trap our students into this vicious circle of never ending thoughts, right? We have a role. But our discussions also is not predetermined by the teacher's questions. Our discussion leads us to natural questions and natural answers. Um, and it's a beautiful thing to see. And I have been a uh, part of many seminars as a student myself here at Great Hearts. And um, I have appreciated the seminar leader's way of questions because it has helped me to truly uh, be able to understand the boy. And that's what the teacher do here at the school. So um, this is just a little preview of the key name letters. Uh, and then we've had it throughout their, their four years. Ninth and tenth grade is important to know that students do not really delve into the questions of what is good nature, what is a virtuosic life. That doesn't happen in ninth and tenth grade. That happens most in eleventh and twelfth grade. Because what happens in eleventh and twelfth grade is that students uh, really move away from the historical aspect of the name letters and delve into the philosophical aspect while expanding their language. And the grammatical understanding of sentences because guess what? One uh, great aspect of the letters is that you do write papers. Um, and it's become such a lost form in, in, in our society to truly know how to write a good paper. They expect us to do that in college. But if you don't have that experience in high school, the strong foundation, you will not do well in college as well. Because we also are creatures of habit. 
right? And habits sometimes are very hard to break. We already have some excellent A grade students that write very, very lovely. They speak up uh, very strongly in the, uh, their seminars in literature and composition classes. But I get to see that when I observe the students and the teachers. And uh, I'm just so excited what they can do in team with their education here at Great Hearts Western Health Academy. Thank you, everyone. just a few minutes about student life. Um, as you already know, your student is involved in a, ho in, in a house, in our house system, um, and the house system will continue as they move through the grades, but now they're going to be considered as keepers of the culture. Um, so they now have a responsibility to rise to a leadership level in the house. Um, the house system was built specifically to give some intentionality to building community, building friendships, and having the opportunities to find uh, ways to be leaders and the way that they're going to grow the, the culture here at Great Hearts Western Hills. I have asked um, Ms. Riedlinger to, to come, she teaches Latin right now, um, and talk a little bit about her experience. She went to a classical school that had a house system through the high school, and I wanted her just to share a little bit of how that affected her overall experience. Are we sitting or standing? It's up to you. I'll sit. Okay. Um, yeah, so I did part of the classical school. I started in sixth grade and we entered into our class system in the uh, high school era. We were inducted in the ninth grade. Um, I think Ms. Tucker hit on it briefly. The house system offers a lot. Chiefly, it offers, especially to older grades, leadership opportunities, and not just elected leadership opportunities. For example, we had uh, house captains, which are essentially the president of your house, which means you are in a room with ninth through twelfth graders and uh, your captain is running. The teachers are there to facilitate, but they are not in front. They are not calling the shots. The captain is deciding. The captain's making decisions. They're voting democratically to make choices anywhere from where we want to have our house excursion to how we want to do the field day. So that's all student run. That's how it was for me anyway. Um, but outside of that, being in front of a bunch of people and being in charge of people is not endearing. They also have the opportunity to um, use their own personal gifts to uh, facilitate and um, build the community. So, for example, a friend of mine here in the house system, we were in the house of Lewis and got to see us Lewis. Um, and so one day in the field there, our captain decided that our theme was going to be the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which is a book we read here at Great Heart. And my friend, he's not, uh, wasn't interested in necessarily reading, but he's an amazing artist, um, and incredibly self-driven, and so we collected all of these cardboard boxes, and we painted and cut a car-sized version of the, the ship, the Dawn Treader, and we attached it to the outside of Ford F-150, and we loaded our whole house into the back of it and on the back of the trailer, and we were the sailors on the voyage of the dog trailer, and that's how we entered the field day. We entered through a gate and we drove in the truck, and we all jumped out, and the captain had this giant drum because he was uh, in music, and, uh, uh, really into music, and so he had this huge drum that he was banging, and we had all these little chants and stuff. All of that was facilitated and created by the students. The teachers just said yes. <laughs> and um, it's amazing. It's a memory I still have to this day. It's a memory that when I go back to my high school, um, and I still keep up with all those friends, we talk about it. We say, remember that time we made a giant dragon out of cardboard and we all loaded it up in the back of the truck um, and scared some lower schoolers, probably, of the guards exiting. Uh, but that's, that is uh, because we were given the framework house system, to be a part of the team, to show our team what we had to offer, whether it was leadership or creativity or any other gifts that all students have. Um, and you're given a stage on which to do it, and the permission and the careful, watchful eye of our um, faculty that let us do that. So that was my experience. Thank you.
probably know the seventh uh, and eighth graders are putting on our winter house festival that is this Friday, and they are each house is supposed to decorate and run an activity out of each of the booths. Um, so it's kind of our first foray into some level of leadership. Uh, the eighth graders this spring will be able to nominate themselves as a mentor, uh, and the mentor will take the place. Uh, There'll be a group of mentors, and then out of those mentors, we will um, nominate house captains. Um, so the mentors are going to have a lot of different responsibilities in the way in which they serve younger members of the house and then their own houses. Um, so they will they will nominate themselves. They will have to get two um, uh, letters of recommendations from a teacher on campus. Uh, then they'll go through that process of selection. And just before school starts, we will have a um, mentor retreat where they will learn uh, specifically what is expected of them this school, the following school year, and they will also be helping us plan the uh, sixth grade uh, new student orientation day that will be on the Monday before school starts. So we'll be automatically asking them to do some specific things, um, and then there'll be other opportunities within that mentor group to be um, leaders of their house. So if you think about maybe its counterpart in a public school, maybe student council, but my thought is that student council in a public school oftentimes was used as a way to get students to gather up and figure out what they didn't like about the school and what they wanted the administrator to do for them. I want our houses to serve the school. And so each of these mentors are going to be servant leaders. And that's the exciting part of that. So there'll always be a piece of identity. So if you don't want to be a mentor, you don't want to be a house captain, but you just want to be a part of something bigger than yourself, it's going to be building tradition and legacy throughout the years so that they can come back like Miss Reedlinger and talk about those things that now have become legend and lore at the school. That's what this house system is, and that's what you 7th uh, and 8th graders are doing as you are building part of that tradition. Uh, we will continue to have clubs, and clubs are largely steered by student and teacher interest. So a student has an interest, they find its teacher or a console who might be interested in the same thing. They gather at least six to eight other people who might be interested, and we, and we throw a club together. Um, and the clubs, uh, as we move forward, can be run either during morning break or after school. It just kind of depends upon what other things students are doing. We will continue to some extent some level of intramurals into the upper school. Uh, the intramurals that you've been involved in, um, the fifth and sixth graders and seventh and eighth graders have been involved in, uh, for sports that the uh, school does not run, so something like a archery, uh, archery would be done during during uh, as an intramural. So you wouldn't have to play intensely for the school, but you could still play intramurals against each other and enjoy just the fellowship of competition and camaraderie. Um, and then, of course, we'll have events. So you should have in the back of your packet a list of the proposed ninth grade events for next year. It's in the in the back. It lists. Um, what we hope to do over the next year. Uh, so it lists the two mentor retreats. Of course, we always have our opening house assembly on the first day of school. Athletic field day will be in October. Uh, we have a mystery event we have not yet unfolded for November. December will be the Winter House Festival again. The January, there's a high school symposium. February, there'll be an eighth and ninth grade swing dance. In March, there'll be a My Antonia Cowboy event after the students have read uh, My Antonia. And we have a special uh, Western band we've already discussed coming out to do live music. Um, and then April, we'll have our academic field day. Um, so those are just to highlight a few, but that is not all of the things that we do. And as you know, every Friday during Lyceum, we do an inner house competition. So there's always something to do here that draws and brings camaraderie. I'm going to ask Coach Disney, who's our athletic director, to come up and talk to us a little bit about the athletics that we are growing here at Great Hearts Western Hills. Uh, we will be uh, moving into more specific competition as the years go on.
here in the great state of Texas. In fact, we currently have a cross-country team and track team that do compete in Teak South, and our cross-country team is very successful. Within the first year, they made it to the state, and we placed in that out of 16 teams, which was a very big deal for your first time being in a team. So going forward, what we can expect for us, especially since we're only adding a year at a time, so we sure we'll only have ninth grade, the beautiful thing about being in Teak South is also play with your ninth graders and you can form a high school team in that way. And obviously being in ninth grade, we don't necessarily want to play varsity, where we might play against other teams who have all seniors and have a lot of experience. So the, the flexibility of the staff also allows us to play a JV squad and still utilizing those eighth graders and those ninth graders. And as we grow, we will continue to add on varsity athletics along with our JV and depending on the So what are we going to offer? And that's a great question. It's really student-led. We cannot have a volleyball team because we don't have enough students who want to play volleyball. We had a lot of students, thankfully, who were very interested in volleyball. I think we had over 65 young ladies come up for volleyball, and it sure was, it was a massive turnout. It was beautiful. So I think we'll be fine then. So ideally, what we would like to do is we would like to have volleyball. Starting out, uh, great cards at the district here in San Antonio is going to start a rugby team. Most likely, we will still have a flag football team if the interest is there and we honor that interest. But starting in October, we actually have a coach over at Northern Oaks who's going to come and teach our boys how to play rugby. So as we grow, by the time we have our seniors, we should have a full rugby team that will play within, uh, play within the great heart system. And the great thing about that is, is rugby is a very big sport in Dallas and in, amongst all of our other districts. So it, there will be a lot of opportunities for competition with that sport. Other sports we plan on offering in the fall would be cross country, of course. Um, in the winter, we plan on having basketball. And in the spring, really, this is a spring winter sport. Soccer would be another big sport, as well as track and field. We've also had a lot of students that approach us about interest in baseball and softball. And luckily for us, the YMC is right there, and they have moved uh, that we can utilize. So those would be the sports. There's a lot of singular sports that so long as they garner the interest we would have, uh, we have the coaches for. For instance, swimming and diving was one of them. Uh, I know it's lots of this Lots of this has a wonderful program, a wonderful coach there. And we have a coach here who's very interested in it as well. And then other one, other sports that we've talked about were powerlifting. So we will offer a strength and conditioning program, and by the time our students are in varsity athletics, it will be a part of their uh, a part of their sport program that is required that they attend a strength and conditioning session. Because at the end of the day, we, we want our students to be good on the field, but we want them to understand the components of movement, we want them to do it in a safe manner, and we want them to do it in an effective manner. So adding in those things of how do you get your body strong, and how do you get your body ready, and do you have the speed and agility to not only manage your life, but also manage the court, well, then that will also, um, those are things that, those are components that we plan to have going forward. So that needs to be the question. Okay. So we will probably have clinics and things like that in the spring oh, and the summer. Oh, yes, that's, yeah. thank you for adding on to that. Yes, um, that completely really escapes my mind. Yes, so in the summer there will be clinics, we'll have open gyms. It, for instance, uh, I was talking with other athletic directors the other day, if you're great at basketball, wonderful, but the more time you have the basketball in your hand, the better you're going to be. So clinics would uh, happen over the summer, week-long, month-long clinics, um, as well as we would have different practice opportunities and so on. It's very hard when you're in a small school to have year-round sports. For instance, basketball really can't practice in the fall. We need a gym for volleyball and so on and so forth. We have students who are not participating in that fall sport, but they're intending to play in basketball. That is when their open gym times would occur in the fall. That is when their strength and conditioning times would also occur. And I hope that clears that up. Yes. Thank you for coming.
master's in school counseling, and that's a miracle because um, I come, I'm a first generation student. Um, my parents were very hardworking. If I didn't have mentors along the way, I wouldn't be where I am today. And that really promoted me to go into the field in which I absolutely love and am passionate about. Um, do you want me to? This is Mrs. Wood. She is one of our counselors. We have a, a team of 22 counselors across Arizona and Texas, which is amazing. I think a lot of people say, do colleges know about great hearts? Absolutely. We've been doing this since 2008. Um, we have relationships with many colleges um, around the nation, and so I think sometimes we think about Texas that we're young, but we are not. We have been out there and we're very well known. In fact, um, I came from a kind of a, sorry, I'm just saying, uh, a very, um, a high school in the Chicago area before I found Great Hearts that was very um, high achieving. Um, and we had some pretty impressive students. When I came to Great Hearts, for the first time in my entire career, and I think I've been 20 some years, College reps are asking me about students. I'm not promoting our students to them, they're asking me. When I'm on campuses or when I'm on a college visit, they're seeking out, who's the Great Hearts counselor you wanna to talk to them? Why? Because our students are doing well on their campus. And I'll talk about that today. Why are they doing well? Um, why are they sticking out from the crowd when they're on um, a college campus? So we'll go ahead and talk about the mission. Um, did you, are you my, my partner here? Oops, I went already too hard. So, you know, we, we really align college counseling with the mission. Um, are we aren't preparing our students to be test takers. This is very apparent in some of our um, colleges that are telling us our kids are the ones sitting in classes. They're the ones participating. They're the ones not saying, hey, what's on the test? Like other students that have been in um, other schools. And so it's a very exciting thing for me to be a part of. You know, we're looking past getting into a school or um, what is that student going to do after. We want them to thrive, whether it's in a four-year college, a two-year college, a certificate program. Um, we are really looking at the whole picture, and that's what we're developing here at Great Hearts, that product, the end result. There's a revolutionary approach that we're doing with our curriculum that's sticking out um, um, how our students are when they um, leave us and what they do. Um, it's exciting to see the two students who came today and how well that they, they are talking in front of people. Um, that's unique. Um, that's something that's not always um, that you see in, in this generation of kids. And so they're thriving on campuses and they're thriving on the things that they decide to do. One of the things that we pride ourselves on is this individual attention. At Great Hearts, we are college counselors. Um, we like to call ourselves post-secondary counselors um, because we are not just college counselors, but the students looking at something else. Um, but there's an individual approach. We are wanting and getting to know your students and helping them become and fulfill their fullest potential. Um, and, and that's a different path for each person. And so when we look at our small caseloads, which is intentional, I have colleagues across the nation are jealous of our small caseloads um, and the ability that Great Hearts allows us to just be college counselors. We don't do um, scheduling every year. That's already done. That's a huge thing in my past life, pre Great Hearts, that spent many hours scheduling classes. Um, but that allows time to really um, assist students in, in helping them in their process. We're, we're really centered around um, scholar-centered advisement. So we, we really build those relationships. So your college counselor here will be working on building relationships with your student, getting to know them. So your student is comfortable. Um, and, and that's really a, a piece that we, we are very, um, that we don't take lightly and that we, we seek out students that maybe aren't as um, outgoing as others. Um, we're very individualized and intentional. You hear that a lot. So college counselors have the ability to cater to the cult, to the campus and the needs of the students of that class. So every student, every class is different. And so we have the ability to create programs if needed, bring in what, um, a, a class. Ms. Woods is doing a career fair at her school this year 
um, which is very exciting. Um, so we have that ability to, to mold and to, to really meet the needs of our students every year. Um, we're a resource and a partner with families. Um, we, there's a lot of noise out there in this process. It's complicated. It's complicated helping your student decide that next step. Um, and we're here to be that neutral voice. We're here to help um, and to help you and to give you good advice and to give you, if we don't know it, we have that network of 22 counselors as well as um, other people in our field that we, we have relationships with which we can get the answers. So they're a great resource. We also have resources in, um, for our students. So we start from Anonymous. It's a premier platform. So freshman year, students will have a count, an account on Anonymous. This is something that they're going to use throughout high school and a, and a good resource in which they can search for schools. It's wonderful. Um, if you go on a college website or, or any website, sometimes if you don't know what you're looking for, it can be very complicated. This lays it out so perfectly. You can save schools, compare schools. Um, there's programs, there's summer programs that are on it. Um, and so freshman year, students will start learning how to use this, this program. Um, and then it'll carry on through the time that they're with us all the way till they graduate. So when we look at the high school roadmap for college counsel or for counseling for your student, we really start freshman year of looking at building that transition to high school. Um, and we're looking at starting to talk to students about getting good grades and, and study habits and developing those, introducing them to our, our audience. And then as we go on, we start building, which is more exploration, connecting the dots, um, helping them. And then junior year is when really we get individualized, and that's when we find students are ready for making some, some decisions. Uh, we get college reps on, on your campus. Um, sophomore year, so it comes to freshman, where we start um, talking to students about different things, and then as well as um, certificate programs and everything else. So, that senior year, we really hone in. Um, it's almost like having an independent counselor that's helping your students. We have college boot camps. Um, we are uh, application boot camps, walking them through the process every step of the way, financial aid nights. It was so many I thought this was, but don't, don't list them all because it is overwhelming of everything we do do, but it is an all-encompassing to help families and students through the, the entire process. So we're looking at academics and keeping those grades up and focused. Um, and then we're going to kind of, that exploration piece is going to be huge. Career, we do self-exploration um, assessments to help students kind of decide what they want to do. We're asking kind of a big question early on, right? What are you going to do with your life? Um, what do you want to do? What is that major going to be? Um, and we have a lot of tools and resources in which we're going to walk your student through that. Um, to help them decide and connect. Um, extracurricular freshman year, we're going to talk about how important it is to get involved. You had some great activities, the house system, um, and some of the sports and things that you have on, on campus here. We're also going to talk to students about summer programs. How are they using their summer? Are they intentional with their summer? Um, are they learning something? Um, how are they building that resume? Not only just for college or for right after, but for life, for a job. Um, our students, uh, we, we try really hard for them to have a resume when they leave us. Um, and so that whether they're um, in the workforce or whether they're on a campus, they have that resume ready to go um, to, to use. And then research. We're going to teach, using our Navion system, students how to research colleges um, and how to find best matches for them. Um, and then the resources. I can't tell you the abundance of resources that we have as a network. Um, and other relationships that we have to assist students and families through this. We'll have guest speakers on um, financial aid that we, we hone in on, some of our reps that we have relations, college reps that we have relationships with. Um, so there's a lot there that I'm not sure I'm doing justice for right now, but. So that's really what you're gonna get this, this all-encompassing um, college counselor experience for your students here. Um, the personal graduation plan that we did talk is on your um, handout of, of what that looks like. Um, it's set curriculum, 
And what a student at Great Hearts ends up with is a uh, Texas High School Foundation Diploma, which is distinguished that they go through our entire program and pass all the classes. Um, the endorsements are the multidisciplinary, arts and humanities, and STEM. So they have all those three endorsements by participating in our curriculum automatically. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's ex an exciting time um, when we see STEM out there because a lot don't think we're STEM. I'll show you a slide later on how many of our students go into STEM, um, and it's, it prepares them well. Our classes are all honors besides our applying arts, so there's a rigor there that's well known. When a student applies to college, they are only looked at as the school that they, uh, that they attend, so they are not compared to others. That's one thing that we stick out is um, in the application process is that families choose this honors curriculum that is different than um, probably what you get an AP curriculum, which is comparable, but just different. AP curriculum is done by College Board, um, and we see that our honors is just as rigorous or even more um, on our classes. So on your handout, you have the great hearts overall, the network. This is uh, Texas broken down that I wanted to share with you. Um, what's exciting is we've had some great successes last year, um, and this year we are coming in. Um, so we had five National American Commended and five National Hispanic Scholars. We have 17 identified in the next class of class of 22. So we are already on um, kind of shooting higher this year on that. Um, our students do very well with scholarships, as you can see. 82% of our students receive a merit scholarship. 44% um, um, graduate with a 3.5 or higher in a honor court at graduation. Um, so we're very proud of how they do and um, you know where they're where they're headed to after college, and I'll share that testing. Here's just the last year. Um, this is really exciting to me because this happened during COVID. This is generally one test. Sometimes um, in my previous pre um, Great Hearts life, kids would take maybe five or six, seven tests um, before it's submitting. Most of our Great Hearts kids, students take one or two, and the scores are um, great for them. And um, you can see where we fared last year with, with our data, so we were above state and national averages with our testing. One of the things that college counselors do too is we um, are coordinating test prep in schools. Um, juniors or sophomores will take the PSAT, um, and then they'll take it in their junior year. The national merit is based off a junior year PSAT test. That's where some of those honors and recognition come from. Um, and then all students, or all juniors, will take the SAT their junior year on campus, which we are very excited for. That's something new. They, our students are testing on campus, which is probably the best environment for them, so we've been very excited um, to, to welcome that on our campus. So last year we had 373, and this is just in Texas, total acceptances from different colleges. Um, that is great. <laughs> um, they, um, especially during the COVID year. Um, so we had um, 33 acceptances of our 120 to Texas A&M. Um, I just want to put some of these numbers in perspective for you so you can understand where our students fall. So when you, um, if you look up Texas A&M and you look up their, grad, uh, their acceptance rate, um, they will, they will be 63%. So for all the students that they receive applications for, 63% are getting in. Great Hearts students, it's 80% last year of the students that applied were accepted. Um, UT Austin, um, their acceptance rate is, is about a 30%. Uh, we were a little higher on that, 35% with our students who applied. So we had 14 acceptances last year. And then Rice, we had, um, Four acceptances, um, and they have a 10% uh, admission rate, and we were 20% for the students that applied. So we do very well. There's a, a sampling um, of 
list up there of uh, some acceptances last year. Mrs. Woods was just sharing, this is what we do. We get excited. We, we had some great acceptances this year already. Um, and we had, I think we had three students sign for um, college-bound students with sports in the network. So um, it's very exciting, the things that are happening on campus. Our matriculation is, is wonderful of where our students are going, and that's one thing that we are very proud of. We know where our students are going. So last year, 72% of the Texas students went to college, um, went to a four-year. Um, our 15% going to a two-year lesson certificates and others, we saw a lot staying home and closer to home because of COVID. So that's where you see kind of a little smaller number in, in Texas than the overall. 6% took a gap year. Gap years are when students apply to colleges and, and then they take time off to either work before going on to college. And then we had 3% military, 3% went right into the workforce and we had 1% go international. It was kind of sad actually. We get a lot of students want to go international and then that was kind of crushed because of COVID. So they do wonderfully in that process. And then the major part. So um, last year, our students and, and the selected majors, um, we had 58% of our students going into a STEM major last year. 47% um, of them were female, and so right down the middle, and 53, and there's a, a breakdown of what they were interested in going into. One other thing that floats out there that I hear a lot, I came from a, my last school, I uh, was the AP coordinator, um, 3,500 tests at the school that I went to. So we gave 33,500 tests. Um, I was interviewing because my husband uh, had a new job during AP season, came to Great Hearts, and my heart was changed. I didn't know a different way, quite honestly. I didn't know that was available. I was at a school that I thought I had my dream job. It was very, uh, when I left, um, quite many applications for this school to be a part of. I thought I had made it, and then great hearts. I came on campus and I said, no, hey, wow, that's interesting. And um, that approach is, is wonderful. If you are somebody that um, is looking at AP, you, you really need to do your research behind it. Um, there are, I think there's some false ideas on um, students graduating early. Well, I challenge you to go look on websites and see who's graduating early because I have been doing this a long time and I don't see kids graduating three years. I see them graduating four or five, six. You have to read the fine print. Usually on the website it says 80 some percent, six year graduation rate. Mind you that Merit scholarships are only for four years. And so when we think we're getting ahead with AP, it's not always the, the, the fact. In fact, today I was talking to um, another headmaster who was in, um, he was a, a selected, took one of his son's um, engineering program. They went on and there was about 20 students in, the, in the, the program and they said, raise your hand if you had AP calculus. Everybody raised their hand except, of course, our great court students. Uh, they're like, oh no, everything's so oh, no work. And then the person decides to say, well, how many are you going to go on for an advanced degree? Everybody raised their hand. They said, you're going to need to take college level calc because that's what they're going to be looking for um, when you go on. So it's really important to, to take a look at that. So we really recommend CLEP testing. And this is some of the advisement that CLEP is done by College Board. It actually was before AP, believe it or not. CLEP is something that um, is widely accepted by most universities. It has no alteration to curriculum. Um, students, if they have strength in an area, it might be, we don't want to recommend that they over-test just to test. We want to do some research, and that's where college counselor does with that individual attention. Um, say your student is very, has a strength in biology freshman year. Maybe your college counselor may be recommending that you take that CLEP test during the summer. You can take that test anywhere. It's not on a certain day. Um, and you can take it even at home. Um, and it offers a broader range of tests, too. 
Um, and so there's, there's this piece of which we as college counselors help with that advisement of what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. Uh, we don't want students over testing ever, um, and we want something that on their other end that is really helping them and not hurting them in, in their next um, goals. And I can keep talking because that's why I, I, I just really believe in what we're doing, and it is something that I devote um, a lot of time to, and I love. I'm the person behind the scenes that knows most of the students. Um, because we are really looking at wanting them to be successful, helping our college counselors here in the Texas area help serve your students and serve them well. Um, I do have my card here, and I encourage you, please take it. If there's ever anything that you have a question about, please reach out. I, I really want to make sure that you have the right information um, and that you're making the best decision for your, your students. And so, um, can we can we open up for questions? Because like, we talked about a lot. Yes. So you mentioned uh, they will graduate with distinguished and endorsement. Mm -hmm. What exactly? How does that show up on their um, like yeah. on their transcript? So it's it's noted on the transcript. So the question was, how does on a, a student when they get the distinguished diploma and the endorsements, it shows on transcripts? And that's where it's, it's noted. So the college will just see that as the same as the state of um, the other one? Yeah, it, it's probably in the state of Texas, it's more um, known. Outside of the Texas, it's more there, well, all of them are going to really look at a student's grades. The, the rigor of the curriculum is, is what's going to be most important to them. Um, but the, the, the endorsements are just a product of what we're doing, basically. Do you have any other words on that, Mrs. Woods? Um, I would just say that in Texas, so everything's different, but in Texas, uh, there's a foundation high school program that's 22 credits, and that's like a student barely, barely graduating, getting a diploma, going into the workforce, and maybe going to community college. But that distinguished level of achievement is required to go to four year college in Texas. So, like AM, for example, won't even look at a student unless they're at that. I guess the point of it is that the, the curriculum that Great Hearts offers meets the, the college curriculum in Texas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? <laughs> oh, go ahead. The, the, uh, we don't do rank in class, correct? So how rank in class? So rank is for juniors. We do send a letter to families. Um, it's abiding by the law in Texas of students that have uh, achieved the top 10%. But we do not rank. Um, rank could be one of those things, and this one might want to come in and speak on that too. Uh, colleges will rank your student. Um, our state colleges will. And most of the time, would you say, Mrs. Woods, that they're receiving a higher rank than they would in a smaller population. But we don't see any difference of as far as acceptances and, and students getting in. They're still doing pretty well. So the, the automatic like top five percent in Texas colleges. Um, so for Texas A&M, it's the top six percent. Um, oh, oh, A. I'm sorry. Top. I meant to say UT Austin is top six, and then it's automatic admission for uh, Texas A&M top ten percent. We're finding that most of our students generally get in. I think with with our acceptance rate at 80% of Texas A&M. So it wouldn't really make a difference that we don't have to introduce all the places in class when it comes to admissions? Unless you're students at the top, but then if you, yeah. No, it's not a hammer. Most colleges or most high schools have um, don't rank. Um, Texas because of the law rank, um, and so that's where, where that ranking comes in and, and the law here in Texas and, and in admission to the state schools. But it's more common for high schools not to rank. Yes? For graduation, you mentioned we do admissions and admissions and admissions 
So at Great Horn, so the question was uh, the, the amount of credits. So they will, uh, for graduation, because we're a set curriculum, they'll graduate with 26.5. The state requires, I think, 26 for a distinguished diploma. Oh, because that would be the foundation. And so that, that, that's the minimum. So the state gives two diplomas currently. The foundation, which is 22, and then 26 is the distinguished one, which is um, essentially saying college ready to a four year university. Any other questions? Oh, I, I would like to hear from my friends over here. On the uh, test prep or mm -hmm. uh, the PSAT, is it just the PSAT or is there actual test prep? Like, does it happen like actual uh, preparation before the PSAT? So, talking about test prep before the, the testing. So, um, it, it really depends on the campus and the test scores that we're seeing and what we're offering. Um, at Mrs. Mrs. Woods at her campus right now is offering, is it three different test prep programs? Well, two. Two right now. So a, a after school one and then a... They're not in the curriculum, the school day, but there are optional add-ons that uh, the family can opt to. Okay. Um, we have uh, work on bell work, which is leading up to some of our campuses are doing bell work, um, preparing for that class. Um, and, and a lot of that is just being familiar with, um, almost with the test itself. Um, a lot of our college counselors will do some testing sort of advisement when they meet with students um, to help them decide what's the best for them. Um, there's a lot of test prep op options out there. And so um, that would be a conversation with um, college. It's not one size fits all. And on test prep, I will tell you, um, Pre here, where you store, we uh, did uh, a huge study. We were looking for the best test prep out there. There was not one that won. It was really came down to the student. If I had students who achieved well, they had a book that was twenty-five dollars, but they were very um, just really good at following that program. And then all the way up to uh, families that paid for independent or uh, a tutor lots of money, um, and it would really came down to that student and how many they, they uh, attempted to. Mrs. Wood will be offering test prep on her campus, and it really comes down, I think you saw that last year with the students that showed up, that participated, were the ones seeing um, improvement on their scores. We really don't recommend, or I don't personally recommend test prep um, until really junior year. Yes? So sorry, I couldn't hear you on that. Yes. Right. Oh, so you transferred out of grade. Oh, okay. So it really depends on where that it would be the receiving school that would evaluate the transfer to determine where they, and depending on their curriculum, would be receiving that. Generally, they'll accept whatever was taken and then place the student based on theirs. So I can't really... Um, so the, the Cal one is a, and the Cal 1 and 82 is, a, is comparable to, to uh, AP, AB, and BC. Pre calc is built in, there's one level, I'm not the math expert. It is pre calc built, yep. It's built in the 11th grade to offer it only if you take algebra 1 in the 8th grade. If you take algebra 1 in the 8th grade, you'll get pre calculus and the calculus are not your senior year. I think it's different from what's on this. Um, I can go back to the, the, the one, the first one, right? Yes, the one that you have in front of you does not show free algebra in the grade. So it's just that all students can use free algebra in the grade. Yes. So if you go back, if um, she shows the credits, then it's clear there, right there. Algebra 1 in middle school, they will do geometry, you go to geometry in ninth grade, they will do 
algebra 2 trig in 10th grade, they will do calculus 1 in 11th grade and calculus 2 in 12th grade. The top one is the top. There are some that are taking free algebra. You would know that though. If you don't know that, your child is taking algebra 1. And algebra 1 is for high school credit at grade cards. Does that make sense? Okay. Had to go in the math part.
And that's where that, you know, that um, individualized matching, right? And, and it touched on a, on a, a resume in a college that you intentionally, your student intentionally went and did something versus they were in a class or, or something that, and that, that's something they can, I talk about, that's something they can write about an essay about in college, that I did this program and this is why. Because it was something that they wanted to do and it was something that they, you know, felt. And on the other hand, um, I had a student who thought they were pre-med, did a program, and was like, no thank you. And now is in France at a pretty premier business, international business school. Um, but all her life she thought that, and then it wasn't until she did a summer program at one of the colleges that she was like, this is not for me. So, yes? Senior thesis. Senior thesis. That's another one that um, I, we're just talking about that we hear from colleges. Our students get on campuses, and when they hear that first 10 page paper that's due in two weeks, the great students are like, okay, I can do that. Yeah, it's a whole year long process. You get, uh, actually, you, you get matched with your, you get matched with a, uh, one of your teachers will be your thesis senior advisor. Um, you will start discussing and talking about what you think, which book from the curriculum do you think you want to base your thesis on, and then maybe a book they should read over the summertime that might be the counter argument to that question. Um, and then you're going to meet with that senior thesis advisor throughout the school year, and they'll have deadlines for you, in which you'll be in the I need your thesis statement, your opening paragraph, and then an outline of how you're going to defend it, your counter argument, and then we're going to talk about that in October, and then you meet again, and then you have a deadline for your first rough draft so they can read over it, um, and then I'm not sure that did you all uh, ever do a mock of your presentation? Junior year, we uh, like there's each uh, quarter uh, you could sign up to do a book, um, and like several students out of the class will write a smaller paper, um, but we'll do a presentation. So you get the, it's like a smaller version of practice the year before. And all along, for since they've been here, they can do all kinds of things in which they're expected to do presentations. So the thesis is just a bigger one. Um, and I know that Susie would tell you that she was, she probably would say she was the shyest one in her class, but she did an amazing the senior thesis defense. Um, and each of the students that does a senior thesis defense uh, will have a panel of high school, of their own teachers. Um, one will be their advisor, and then they will choose two or three others who will sit at a table and a panel who will ask them a series of questions. Um, and then they open it up to the audience. So you, student, other students will come, other teachers will come, and then your family and friends will come, and you'll be able to ask the, 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 the senior any questions. And it's such a wonderful opportunity to uh, get the opportunity to defend, and then, oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, so some is, is planned. Obviously, they give their defense, but then they have to answer questions they weren't prepared for. Um, proudest moment as a mama, let me tell you. Um, and they won't, they aren't just shuttled off, and every single one of them did it, um, and did an amazing job. Yeah, yeah.